Okay, certainly uh, good to see you all this far, and uh, I really enjoy this up here, especially the book over here entitled Designed by God. You don't hear a lot about the word design. When you do, it sometimes causes uh, a reaction, a negative reaction, because if we increase our glossary, we lose our either ordinance that we really like. You know, we humans like black and white answers to our questions. We want, well, just it's either this or this. Now, there's plenty in the Bible of this or that, either or. But those are legitimate. As you turn to Genesis, the first chapter, the first verse, we'll just look at that for a moment and then uh, make some observations. Because in the field called religion that we've learned far too much about, you all are aware of the fact that people will accuse, that categorize you as, Either all things are determined or all things are random. Well, that's irresponsible on both hands, is it not? Because determined is a Bible word. And men are causal. God is causal. But if you introduce the word design, it changes everything because design would not find necessary to negate or remove anything or any feature or element in that which God designed. So in the first verse, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, we see a remarkable statement as we've reviewed this text before, and I'll emphasize the word design, but if in the first three letters of the first word in the Hebrew Bible is the statement, Son of God, there's a letter, Prince of the House, the second letter, Head, Highest, the first letter's B in the alphabet, Beth in Hebrew, Son, and Aleph is God. Son of God, the highest prince, by the hand of violence, crucified. But now notice the word design, the word design there. Now, when Moses wrote this, it's a revelation for the Hebrew emancipates who had been centuries in Egypt and had experienced what it is to be assimilated by a culture. And only when they began to be uh, mistreated did they want to be delivered. As we all know that's the case. Only those of us who are sick need a physician. Only those of us who are in a strait want someone to help us out. Now that's life. And the Bible even tells us when you are not sick, then we should be rejoicing and singing in our hearts and that we should be prepared to come alongside others and even stand in their place and pray in their place because they can be so fatigued under the chronic realities and negative externalities of their condition that they have been overwhelmed by despair. You know, don't you like to hear what well people say they would do? Or what people who aren't in your situation say, if I were you, I would do this or that. Well, you've never been me. You've never had this happen before. And I don't recall you ever intervening under any circumstances on behalf of others in any situation. So our best answers are the ones that we have when we're most distanced from the circumstance. I mean, wouldn't you rather listen to the guys this fall that come in and tell us what they would have done when they were handed the football rather than the young man who could run 40 yards in less seconds than they could make it to the television? I mean, I love, have you, do you love hearing people critique athletic athletes, you see? as if somehow we might be able to do that backflip the way that person did it, or I would have run to the right instead of the left. I would have actually been in traction if I'd even tried to go out there on a field with those. So we all have something to say. It's just really remarkable that the first word in the first chapter of the first book of the Bible says that the entirety of the creation was designed for Jesus to prevail. For Jesus to prevail and to conquer and the Bible says that He condemns sin in the flesh. Now, if we understood the consequences of sin according to the magnitude and scope as revealed in the Scriptures, which we notice that one of the archangels, as the account is given, in his heart wanted to lift himself up. He wanted to supplant that central person in the Godhead, Jesus the Christ, and he wanted to have that universe centered around Him. Well, 
some have quantified it and have said that the universe in which we find ourselves today is just one billionth of the original in Genesis 1.1. If that's the case, and as we now have no rationale for explaining why the universe is filled with everything out there is dead, cosmic debris falls through our atmosphere and bombards our planet in tons. Something bad happened out there. <laughs> And we're on a fragment so small that compared to the universe, which is only one billionth, according to those who quantified it, of the original creation in Genesis 1.1, that that on which we find ourselves today is so small that you couldn't find it unless you were born on it. You say, I don't understand. Well, the entire design of the Bible is for the least to be used by God for Him to receive the greatest glory. And on a planet that is so insignificant in relationship to the universe in scope and scale, that which happened on a hill called Calvary, that Golgotha, that event of the crucifixion, is the center of the universe. The Genesis 1-1 and everything that's happened ever since. But if, if we don't appreciate that, that's certainly indicative of our character flaws being finite and fallen. Do you know we have two circumstances? We're finite in our thinking and our estimation and ability to appreciate things. Because unless we can place it in terms we can understand, then we don't even know for certain in our own mind and hearts if we believe it even exists. And then being fallen, we have character flaw, flawed character. And look how we treat each other. And people are rushing to come to the United States. And some of the worst experience they ever had were trying to get here because in route, some were abducted. And upon arrival, some were killed or trafficked. We hear the tragedy of someone who goes and fights on foreign soil to defend our nation only to be killed on a street corner in the nation that he gave his life and placed it at risk to defend. And we say, why is this like this? Well, now the... The, everything wasn't designed for us to win, and how do we win then, you would ask? Well, according to the Bible, Jesus lets us win by faith. Simply trust Jesus for everlasting life, and you and I, who could never fulfill the law, we, didn't, we weren't able, and nor are we willing. And I notice that bothers some of my religious uh, acquaintances when I say, you don't even want to fulfill God's law. And, you know, their inner, all of us have an inner self-righteous person. He wants to say, wait a minute, how could you say that about me? I said, well, just enumerate the 613 law codes that you're implying by your, I'm aghast that you could suggest that me and my self-righteousness would not want to fulfill the law of God. Well, go ahead. Just start citing the 613. Most of us can't even differentiate the 360 from the 253 and the 360 is one negative command for each day of the 360 day year and the 253 for physiology and anatomy of our bodies because the part of our body that we use for a crime was the part that was penalized. You remember in the Bible, Jesus said, here's what we'll be doing from now on, an unprecedented principle. You men who would presume a daughter, a wife, a mother, or a sister, a woman, to be the object of your desire then with that eye that you set on her and that foot that you used to travel to her and that hand to apprehend her, pluck out that eye and sever that hand and remove that foot. So you see all three of those are involved in that crime. Because you remember at the time Jesus said that men were having their wives taken because religious men had a... What did they do? They amassed power so they could do it. Why is it that people are so shocked that someone finally succeeds and then they throw their life away? And you say, I wonder what they were doing. Well, that was their ambition in the first place. They wanted money to control others. They wanted power to manipulate others. They wanted it to then consume it on their flesh, the lust of their flesh. And the Bible says that we have not because what we ask for, we ask amiss because we want to use it for our purposes rather than what God would otherwise have expected us as good stewards in whom it should be found that we're faithful to steward what God's trusted us. Isn't that good news that Everything was designed for Jesus to prevail because if Jesus had not prevailed, we would have no hope, you remember? Because Paul even said that if we are people, if there is no resurrection, that is, Jesus didn't actually prevail ultimately and overcome death, crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection, then we'd be above all men most to be pitied because we have placed our hope in something that's futile and vain. 
So if the Bible says everything's designed for him to win and he wins and then we're allowed to win by faith, why do you think every religion on the planet who removes $25 trillion a year from the population to line their coffers by exploiting men, by commercializing Christ, merchandising men, why are they averse to that? Well, I think we just understood why they're averse to because the king of all the kings said, everyone who's already trusted in me is already having everlasting life. He's not holding a, a carrot out on a stick and saying, now if you, you run far enough, because everybody, we've learned what happens with the carrot on a stick, don't we? Because as soon as we went for it, the stick became longer and the carrot became higher and higher. We just couldn't get there. Don't you love those visions that other men cast for other people to go and fetch? Isn't that terrible? That they're doing it deliberately. Don't you love how people are so willing to be against the, another person that all they have to do is cast a division, give them an either or, and their, their gnash and gnaw come out? I've had people say, well, aren't we right? Aren't we on the right side of what? See, those are false choices, or worse, empty, which makes them false. You remember we'd be asked things by religious people, even asked by people that would encroach the congregation of Christ. Are you for this or that? Against this? And you're like, well, you haven't given me any information. <laughs> Why you wouldn't even buy a used car without more information than that. Why you wouldn't even make a decision about what vocation to engage or to pursue in training without more information than that. But weren't we all in the flesh so willing, so willing to jump in? So design is a difficult problem if you're in a religious world. Because if we're taught on one hand everything is determined, or all things are random, which is a false choice, then you place the missing element, which is design. And if God designed Adam, his creation, a causal being, then why do we keep placing it on God? That's our fallen character. See, I'm asked questions often that begin with the assumption that God's culpable for something. For example, if God's so great, then why is there evil in the world? So it, the premise of the question is, I've already thrown God under the bus. <laughs> so now you jump in with me, get on the bus with me, and we'll both drive this bus while you try to explain why God's under it. God's never under the bus. It was a bad question. Because not only should we be asking, why do people do what they do, at least we disclose our hypocrisy and pretending that we don't know. <laughs> because we know why we do what we do. You remember the first book in the first of the New Testament, the New Covenant, tells us that we can go so far that we will actually start asking God for things that He knows and we have to kid ourselves that we don't know, that we only want to consume it on our lust and not do anything beneficial for anyone, not for God's glory nor for the good of another. And I don't know if you all remember, but it was once unethical to not be a good steward of your life. Y'all may not remember that. But a report came out before the turn of that other century and people were aghast in this country about something that happened in New York. Some of you probably don't remember it because none of us were here. But there was a report came out and it was a scathing indictment against people in New York. More money had been spent on this new novelty called chewing gum than on all the mission work supported from that state. Now, today we're like, I don't get it. What's the problem? Because we know there's incalculable number of things on which more money is expended than on advancing the gospel and seeing that the kingdom of God comes to be upon this earth. You say, well, I wish somebody would do something about it. God did. He designed you, placed you here right where we are. And if you continue to talk that way, as people would come in even to the Lord's church and say, you all don't do anything here says the person who's disengaged from reality and is one who rebukes and calls God into question to subject him to their judgment and appraisal of his design, which is called the New Covenant Church. Do you notice that? People who have to be doing much less but presuming much more than is even to the brink of blasphemy. You remember, we would like to think it's all from creation to our eschatology, just this or that. But we now know why we want that, don't we? Because I can have a camp without thought. Which means we're not interested in what it says, 
Because what about instantaneity in creation? Which even in physics, by definition, anything eternal can't change or incur a loss of energy. So in Genesis 1, 1, according to Isaiah 48, 3, he instantly... So there's that first earth and foremost event. And no time transpired, no energy was lost. You say, well, I just have a hard time getting my mind around that. Well, the immutability of God makes it even more self-evident. Malachi said that God said, I change not. So he can't incur change. He can't in incur internal friction, which is the instrumental means, mechanically speaking, of how decay would take place. Something has to start wearing down. And we pay a lot of money to take care of things so that they don't wear down, don't we? So if we're not concerned about the magnitude of the God who instantly spoke everything. And actually the word there is not much more than a thought. And it actually refers to the fact that he thought among himself the Godhead and it happened. There's another word, davar, which is more deliberate speech. But this word, when we read through where he made this particular planet, this fragment of a universe that is a fragment of the first earth. He made it so that men could live there. But more importantly, he made it so that on the smallest thing, the most insignificant thing, by any scale of matter and creation and thing, he could destroy and condemn in his flesh the most destructive force ever released in creation. So if he designed everything so that his son would prevail, why do people so miss the mark when it comes to appraising what Christ accomplished on the cross of Calvary? A man once wrote that God had more going on than just a cross on a hill. See how he marginalized Jesus? Not knowing that, according to the Bible, the fullness was pleased to dwell in Jesus bodily. And that fullness meaning the ultimate implication of everything true of the Godhead. So the one who's omnipotent, whose omniscience, his knowledge is infinite. Someone, as I often remind people, asked me, do you think God knows everything? I said, no, everything would be a finite amount. God even knows how much he knows. One dear man was stammering with the reality of this God of the Bible, and he says, well, God only knows things that can be known. I said, and who would decide that? It's as if his problem was with God. Don't let him become too big because then I can't get back to my preference in the flesh. To It's either this or it's either that. And why do we want it either this or that so we can impugn the person who didn't pick either or that, this or that? Does anybody know what it's like to live your life being accused of making a choice that you would other, otherwise have never participated in? I've helped people in relationships and I had to help one person say, you do know they're living out something between their ears that you have nothing to do with. That this person in their marriage or in their family or in their workplace are experiencing what they would be experiencing whether you were the manager, whether you were the husband, or whether you were the father at all. And they were so admired my insight, they didn't know I learned everything in Sunday school, that one company said, what are you doing with those people? I said, well, I'm letting them go and do nothing for someone else. I'm letting them go somewhere where they can have problems with someone else's manager and someone else's company's benefits and someone else's salaries. I don't understand. I said, well, it would be quite a gulf to cross to suppose that somehow that person and I would be engaged in that about which they're speaking. They said, why is that? I said, well, uh, the fruit of my work is showing you that if I were engaged in that, why are we breaking record after record after record after record? Oh, I get it. I mean, a plane couldn't even leave the ground if what people who complain about by being on one had anything to do with the production of one. Hey, don't you love those videos where it shows some woman trying to hit some woman who's trying to hit a, the woman about something on the plane when I'd have hit eject? And their seat would have gone right out. You say, Brother Carl, that's not right. If you push that button and people fly out of the plane, no, I'll tell you what would happen. They would all remain seated. They'd all be quiet. Because you know, people can be so out of touch with reality, they'll forget they're 20,000 feet above the air. Going hundreds of miles an hour, and she's wanting to say that someone didn't give her the right peanut. Or someone said something about them. Now you think people are out of touch with reality. Take them up in a rocket we call an airplane, fly them 100 miles an hour, and watch them not even remain cognizant of that fact. You say, Burkhardt, what are you getting at? I don't know. 
I've seen people that have a lot of things to say about nothing, and I was thinking, but what could we have accomplished with that? You know, when God designed life for us, it was for us to have it in abundance, right? So if people don't want it in abundance, why is that a problem? Because the rest of us who are here have to pay. Do you notice that? The rest of us have to pay. In your workplace, in your social life. I was on the side of a field with a great team. Our team won the championship that year. And some man, an adult on the other side of the field, didn't realize that one of our assistant coaches was a child. You know, that man came unbuckled in his brain and launched toward this child because he knew not to come toward me, right? People like that don't approach something of substance. But you know, I had to snap him out of his delusion. I said, this is a child. I think he was 19 or something. And this man's brain unbuckled and he released this fury. You know, he didn't even remember it was a ball game. And I'm running on the sideline in another game and a man for whom I once worked and served and made a great success for him saw me running and he said, this isn't the Super Bowl. I said, it might be. It might be. What was it? Two years later, one of the players died of cancer. I mean, you may be in the only game you get. And if life's a game, you know what? You've already lost. But if it's not a game, it's abundant. <laughs> and you will treasure it. You will seek it. As a matter of fact, when you hear these questions like, do you not believe all things are determined? You're like, well, I know they're designed and I know what I read in the Bible. Nothing you're saying expresses the full elucidation according to the Bible. You know our theism, as they call it, is open or closed? Yeah, any educated person would know this right away. And I mean, educated someone who attended Sunday school for even a year would know, wait a minute, that's a false choice. The Bible says, living God. How many of you serve the living God? Well, if you don't, you're serving a dumb idol and he is a very jealous God and you will wish that in his provocation by your actions to stand against him that what he does to create a lesson for others would not have fallen upon you, but it will for the good of others. Do you know God does things to people for the good of other people? Because they're being put at risk. See, I, I use that airplane illustration for a reason. If I'm on a plane and she's complaining about her peanuts, I say hit the eject button. Matter of fact, give us all one so we can have that option. You say, what are you trying to say? I'm saying when other people's lives are at risk, why do people not take it seriously? Because they don't take their own life seriously. You know how many people I can account to you right now that never took their own life seriously? Why, if you were to write on paper all that God gave us, and let's, for example, let's take that dear soul, and He gave them this and this and this, opportunity after opportunity. So what's the big deal about the Bible? The very first lesson is to understand that it's designed for Jesus to win. You say, but wait a minute, you just said that Son of God, hand of violence, crucified. That's how He won. The victory for us. You remember people would sing the song Victory in Jesus until the people that were enjoying that victory weren't the ones on their side. That's why I always love singing Victory in Jesus because I'm always in Christ, not on anybody's side. It's a wonderful life. It really is if it's in Christ Jesus. And if through the lens of what he prevailed and overcame and what was accomplished by his coming in the first place and by what he created and designed and intended to bring about the greatest glory and the greatest good, then how can we call it into question unless we're still outside of him, not quite understanding a view from him? Because we've learned that everyone talks about the fall of Adam and yet the Bible talks about a lamb slain ever since his disobedience. The Bible tells us about how we're obligated now because Jesus died to lay down our lives for one another and no one wants obligations. You remember, and I'm looking at my moment to begin closing. Does anybody remember when a man's word was his bond? Do you all remember? Anybody ever heard? You heard? Okay. Does anybody remember it was unethical for you not to follow through with what you said? I think Jesus coined it first, did he not? When he said, do what they say but not as they do because they say and then don't do, Right? You know, I had men that would tell me, oh, yes, yes. And then they wouldn't do it. And then it was laughable because I noticed then that for them it was a ploy and a technique to cause some, find someone that was gullible enough to trust that their word was binding upon them. You remember, people like to prescribe 
a performance standard for others that they themselves aren't keeping. That's in the book of Galatians, and the Holy Spirit himself revealed that to us in Scripture. So how does it not often occur to us if we've been scripted and we, the formative power in our lives is unmistakably that of Christ Jesus when he sent his missionary, Paul, to tell us, one of his churches, that now those who are prescribing for you law aren't themselves caretakers or even adherents of it. You remember the very first story in the Bible of the very first siblings. There was no rivalry. There was a person who said, I won't adhere to the standard of my brother. And now religion's out still arguing with each other about lordship salvation. Y'all have heard of that? It says unless you live a certain way, you can't possibly convince anybody that you're a Christian. And then if you don't have final security assured by the way you live, then you weren't really saved in the first place. I love it. Why aren't they in a New Testament church according to the Bible? Because you know what else they say? Oh, you don't have to be baptized like this or you don't have to believe that. You don't have to go to this type of church. Well, those Lord's churches haven't been here for 2,000 years. And then on the next hand, they'll say, Lordship salvation. How would the Lord lord His flocks if He would do it differently any time in the Bible? Did we see Jesus being different to one group than another group? No. Did we see Jesus failing to go to where John the Baptist was, the forerunner? who was miles outside of the city, who was the legitimate, valid, legitimate, scripted descendant of the Levi tribe who were there to present the Lamb of God. And Jesus went there and was baptized by John the Baptist preacher. Nothing any baptizer would say he's sorry about. Jesus then went with those people who had been baptized and they with him began to baptize others. And you know why we still baptize people today? It's because they wouldn't quit back then. <laughs> and our reason is the same as it's always been, to declare God right, Luke chapter 7, to have people have this moment where they come out and declare God right and they commence an unprecedented walk of life because it's, it's with each other in a covenant. Any of you ever helped somebody and then they didn't reciprocate? Well, here's the truth. If you ever helped anybody, that can happen. But the truth is, if they don't reciprocate at your expectation, maybe you've got it too high. Amen? Maybe we didn't really get the lesson that to be like Jesus would see that ten lepers were cured even if only one had the salt to come back and say thank you. And I'll close in this, but once you've lost your salt... You can't get it back. I've often recounted in my mind and sometimes find someone who will be from this community with me. And I talked to a young man yesterday. We were in elementary school together. We were catching up and talking and he once attended this assembly. That was way over yonder at a way back when. And he's telling me about a situation. I said, well, other than the people, everything's perfect though, right? So he, he caused him to laugh for just a moment. Because I said, well, sometimes we can place expectations on others that we don't want to find imposed upon us. So if you see someone that's not serving the way you think they should or giving the way they should, remember it's a could, should, and one day you'll regret that you didn't. So I started telling him, I said, well, in the future, you would need to know that if I could replay it, the majority of the loud speakers who talk so much, I would not hear a thing they had to say. He says, why is that? Because they didn't do anything they said for us to do. Isn't that interesting? So he was curious, as everyone is, why are you still here? Well, I'm here for the same reason that I came here, Jesus Christ. How would anything change about that if the immutability of God is an absolute fact? And it is. If God hasn't changed, His love for me hasn't changed, it couldn't be any greater than giving Jesus Christ to die in my place. I couldn't have a greater identity than one of His sheep on whose behalf He died. I couldn't have a greater leader, a greater guru, a greater master, a greater lord, a greater ruler, a greater despot than Jesus the Christ, the Lord of all the lords, the master of all the masters, the ruler of all the rulers, the despot among all, above all the despots. 
I couldn't have a greater connection with all the powers that be because the word Elohim is also powers, plural, than that one I have through Jesus Christ. So how can we be diminished if by design it's inevitable and impossible that we are in Christ Jesus or impervious to anything that everybody else finds humorous? And have you ever wondered what kind of people think it's funny for someone to fall for their lies? I mean, have you ever noticed people laugh at people who are gullible? But what if they weren't gullible? What if they just trusted someone? What if in our world and in the assembly, we admired people who had that faith of a child, like the child who read today? If you fall, just get up because it's still in you and it'll inevitably come true. What hasn't come to pass here that was inevitably designed by God? Nothing. And everything designed by God came to pass. Amen. So, seizing that child's testimony, let us all be reminded that what's in us is greater than that's in the world because He is a person named Jesus. And when you hear people say, He's not done with me yet, well, let me help you with that one. Get on with it. Get on with it. Because we're not here to inoculate ourselves from the indifference of our own reality. We are in a time-constrained world. And why life is to be treasured because it's temporary. And why crimes in the finite realm incur infinite penalty should cause us first and foremost to understand just how valuable it was what God did for us all men when He takes the death for every man. For someone, a finite person, to reject it in time and space to then call God into question if he prescribes an infinite consequence. Now, have you ever heard of that? People will debate, is hell forever or just a little while? I'm like, well, if that's your biggest concern rather than preventing your brother from going there, I don't want to talk about it. Now, think about the hardness of your heart when your debate about hell is not preventing your neighbor from going there, but do they stay there a while or not? Let's pray. Father, we come to you now. So thankful that you're nothing like us. And Father, we're especially grateful that we can laugh at ourselves and see in ourselves what we pretend to despise in others. Why do we pretend? Because we know it to be true of ourselves. You sent us into this world as salt and light to build up, to edify, to encourage, to lift up, to make the difference that is wanting in this world. And Father, you sent us out to recruit, make disciples for your Son, Jesus the Christ. That would be for your glory and their good and not for a show in our flesh. For you taught us there are many people who are seeking us, but not well, and not for our good. They just see us as a commodity to aggrandize themselves and to have a bigger show in the flesh. And Father, we are so thankful that the biggest show in this universe happened on the cross. When your son, by being faithful to fulfill all righteousness, was willingly hanged on a tree that he might be the curse in our place. Father, we thank you for sending Jesus. We thank you for his faithfulness, his obedience unto death. And Father, for anyone here today that hasn't seized the moment and recognized the brevity of life Father, may they not fall for the lie of seizing the day, but to seize the moment. And from this moment forward, if they haven't been assuring that you're receiving the glory and others the good, may they do so until their last breath. Father, we thank you and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.